start by being honest with you. I didn't actually start to write this talk until last week, because if you ask anyone that knows me, they will say that Kat is a chronic procrastinator. And it's gotten to a point now that every talk that I've given in the last couple of years, I winged it. You see, I love the rush. It makes my heart beat fast. You don't know what I'm going to say next, and neither do I. <laughs> it's a surprise for everyone. And I said this to the TED team, they're like, no. <laughs> well, you've got to get this perfect, this is timed, it's going to be on the TED channel. Write something down. And so I set about the task of writing a talk. And it's been so long since I've done it that I needed a bit of advice. And a friend lent me a book. I said, how to give a TED talk, which I thought was very specific, very handy. So I was flicking through it, and I came across this top tip, just jumped out at me. It said, tell a story that reaches people's hearts. Now, I'm an anatomist. I study the structure of the human body. I literally reach hearts every day. But I don't think that was the point they were trying to get across. You see, to me, professionally, the heart is an organ in the chest. It pumps blood around our bodies. That's what I have to teach, and that's the end of that. But to society, the heart is so much more than that. It's in our language, in our culture. It's our perception of health. It's where we feel intense emotions. It is what it is to be alive. It's our heart. It's the heart of everything. And so when they say tell a story that reaches people's hearts, what they actually mean is tell a story that reaches the soul, that changes people's minds, inspires, engages, makes them enthusiastic. And so I've got to try and reach your hearts now, and I thought, what better topic than the heart itself? Where is it? What is it? What's it doing in there? Because at its basic, the heart is a very simple yet super effective piece of kit. It pumps the blood around our body, it starts beating before we're even born, and it will continue to beat until the day that we die with no breaks, no Kit Kats. It is our constant in life. It is the rhythm of our bodies. So I'm going to start simple with where is it? See, in the, lang in the English language, we have a phrase. If something is at the center of a problem or a situation, we describe it as being at the heart of the matter. And yet, describe, despite using the heart as a synonym for center, there's this pervading myth that it's on the left-hand side. It's not. It's in the center. That, that's where the phrase comes from. <laughs> uh, to demonstrate this to you, I'm going to invite onto the stage uh, my lovely model, Phil. Come on up, Phil. <laughs> now, in the break, I painted the heart onto Phil's chest. Uh, and I did it with UV paint, because I think it looks awesome. <laughs> but also, I'm, I'm hoping that, because it's like this, everyone at the back can also see it. Now, the heart's been painted on in the anatomically correct position. I don't think you can argue with me here. This is in the centre. If it does point off to the left, but actually, it is a central organ. And it is perhaps a little bit higher than you, think you are, if, than you think it is. If you want to find where the heart is on your own chest, I invite you to feel for the jugular notch, which is the bony dent in between your collarbones. Run your fingers down a little bit further, about an inch, and you'll feel a ridge on the bone. We call this the sternal angle. And that is where the top of the heart is. It's where the big blood vessels are coming out. And if you run your fingers down even further until you feel the sternum start to drop off, that's where the base of the heart is sitting. And so it is perhaps a little bit higher than you originally thought it was in the chest. Now, it's a muscular organ. It's made up of four chambers. And we, of these, we've got two atria. So atria comes from the word atrium. We use it in architecture. If ever you enter a big building like a town hall or a library or even the theatre that we're in today, you would have entered via the atrium. It's a big space for receiving people. Now, in the heart, the atria receive the blood. Nice and simple. So, on our right side, we've got blood coming in to the right atrium, which is coming from the body. So, our body is used up all the oxygen, so this blood is very low in oxygen. And on the left-hand side, we've got blood coming in from the lungs, so it's very high in oxygen. And from the atria, the blood gets pushed down to the ventricles, and... The ventricles are the muscular powerhouses of our heart. They're the ones that have got to pump the blood back out. So on the right-hand side, on that right ventricle, it pumps the blood 
up to the lungs, and it doesn't have to be very strong to do that, because if you think about it, your heart's here, and uh, the lungs are there. It's not very far to go. Okay? But for the left ventricle, it's got to pump blood round the body with such force that it can reach the top of your head and the tip of your toes and still have enough power to come back. So a left ventricle is very strong. And the weird thing is that I can't actually show it to you on Phil very well, because when the heart forms, we have a very nice left and right. And as you develop more inside your mother, the heart actually twists. And what you can see on Phil is we have our right atrium here, then the right <coughs> ventricle, and then all the left is kind of hidden around the side. It's twisted around the back. Yeah. When the left ventricle contracts, it's pushing that blood around our body, and that's what we feel as our pulse. So our pulse is essentially the tide of our body. It's the waves of blood pushing through our arteries. And we can feel the pulse anywhere that the artery is close to the surface of the skin. So in the neck, you should be able to feel your pulse, but also at the base of the thumb, uh, in your wrist. But as you can see, there are many other places that a pulse can be taken. And the pulse is adaptable. Our heartbeat is adaptable. As we, as we take on exercise or have a very intense emotional state, our pulses will change. They will adapt with us. Now, the healthy human adult has a heart rate of about 60 beats per minute, give or take, and that's about one beat per second. But if you exercise really intensely, you can ramp that right up <coughs> to more than triple, get up to 200 beats per minute if you really try for it. And that makes sense, because when you're exercising, you're using your muscles, they're working really intensely, they need energy, they need oxygen. The only way they get oxygen is from the blood. And it's using it up fast, so the heart has to beat faster and faster and faster to keep up with that demand. It's a basic supply-demand equation. And your heart will get better and better at doing this. It's just like any other muscle. The more you work it, the stronger it will become. And the stronger it is, the better able it is to sustain you throughout your life. But it's not just exercise that raises the heart rate. You can have triggers from emotional states as well, things like fear, anger, love, attraction. These are responses to stress or arousal. They can affect our heart rate, bring it up or down. In the case of stress, that elevates the heart rate. I'm a very good example of this right now. <laughs> so my resting heart rate is about 60 beats per minute. I'm just going to see where I'm at now. OK, I'm nearly at double that. So that's... <laughs> and there's nothing I can do about that. I, I don't actually feel particularly nervous, but my brain sees 100 people staring at me in silence. And it's going, oh, I might have to run off in a minute. <laughs> might have to just leg it off the stage. It's a possibility. It's not going to happen. Okay. But my brain is seeing this stressful situation. It's going, OK, you've got two options. You're either going to have to fight or flight. So I'm not standing up against 100 of you and fighting you, but you know, I could potentially run away. And so my heart rate has increased because my brain's saying, any second now, you're going to have to leg it. And it's making my muscles ready because it's increasing the oxygen that's going to my legs and my arms if I were to try and punch and kick my way out of the situation. So you can see how our emotional state changes our heart rate. It's not just our heart rate that responds to emotion. You quite often feel intense emotions in your chest. And the reason for that is that the areas of the brain that perceive emotion and physical sensation, especially pain, are very close to each other. And those signals get confused sometimes. So say you're very in, in a lot of emotional hurts and you're grieving for someone, that can feel like a pressure on the chest, a heartache. And that's because of these connections between the, the brain and the heart, and also the connections within the brain getting confused. But because we have this confusion, we have come to associate strong emotions with our hearts. And that is what has allowed this symbol to become the symbol of love. We all recognize this as a heart, 
bit of a love heart. You see it all the time, especially on Valentine's Day. Someone sends you a card with that on it, you go, oh, all right. <laughs> but it's not anatomically accurate. That's anatomically <laughs> accurate. <laughs> But you can see that there are some similarities. Yeah. <laughs> so if someone was like, oh, that, that takes a, a long time to draw. Let's just make it look like that. That's fine. That's fine. So we associate our, the heart with love. And we, we learn this from a young age. You get up Saturday morning, you're watching cartoons. Tom and Jerry come on. Jerry's fallen in love with a lady mouth. All of a sudden, his heart's coming out of his chest. It's beating fast. Look at his pulse race. He is clearly in love. And so we think of the heart as our connection to other people, how we experience emotions about the people around us. But our heart, especially our pulse, is very closely tied into who we are as people. You see, we have an internal rhythm. Our pulse is ticking away, and our brain is very used to that. It's used to this tide, these waves of blood coming through the brain once every second. And when you take that away, all of a sudden the brain gets weird. So we talked about how the heart gets weird because of the brain, but now this is going the other way around. Now, it's not very often the heart gets weird without something being seriously wrong, and that's what I am talking about. If someone ends up on a bypass machine, the reason why they're on that is because they're having open heart surgery. And so if you're having open heart surgery, now imagine you're not the patient. Imagine you are the surgeon, and you're trying to make very small cuts, do very fine stitches on an organ that won't sit still. It gets difficult, it gets dangerous. So we put people that need open heart surgery on a bypass machine because that allows the heart to be stopped safely. We call it heart-lung bypass. That's because the blood gets taken out of the body and put into the machine and we get the gas exchange going on in there, oxygen, carbon dioxide that we have in the lungs, and then it gets pumped back into the body. And we've been using these machines for decades, more than 60 years, which is longer than I realized and then I looked it up. But we've had them for a really long time. And it just seems that no matter how sophisticated they are becoming, they still can't quite mimic the natural rhythm of an individual's own heartbeat, because we are all slightly unique. And this results in a weird thing in about a third of patients. It's called post-perfusion syndrome but it's better known as Pumphead, and I think that's a better name. <laughs> uh, and and Pumphead is what happens when the pulse is disrupted, that internal rhythm is lost while they've been on, under the knife. And when they come round, they're different for a while. It takes quite a while for them to come back, but this disruption in the pulse has changed their cognition and their mood. And you sometimes find people, they might be uncharacteristically demure or aggressive, um, just downright inappropriate is also quite common. They have changed because their brain lost their heartbeat for a while and it didn't know how to cope. It was being satisfied physiologically, it was getting all the oxygen and energy that it needed, but it had lost that rhythm. And so I hope I've kind of showed how not only is our heart our connection to other people, it is intrinsic to ourself. We lose our heart and our heartbeat we lose our sense of self. Our pulse is our measure of life, and it will adapt as you go on life's journey with your activities, with the connections that you make with other people. But we are most alive when our hearts are racing. And I say that we embrace that, that we get as many beats as we possibly can, that we go out there, we push our boundaries, we try new things, we meet new people, we make waves. And we allow ourselves to reach people's hearts, but also allow them to reach ours. We live. Thank you.